All right, and my name is Rory. I'm one of the pastors here. Everybody say hi, Rory. Hi, Rory. Good morning. Good, good to have you here on this Mother's Day. We're going to just uh, spend a few minutes talking about mothers. What is this mothering thing? How did mothers, how did it begin? Well, <clears throat> you go to Genesis, then the Lord God said, it is not right for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is right for him. So the Lord God removed one of the man's ribs and used the rib from the man to make a woman. And then he brought the woman to the man. And the man named his wife Eve because she is the mother of everyone who ever lived. Uh, Eve, by the way, comes from the Hebrew word meaning alive. None of us would be alive without our moms. So what is a mother? A mother is something created the moment her child is born. She never existed before. The woman existed, but not the mother. A mother is something absolutely new and wondrous. And she smiles down at her ba newborn baby. She thinks, before you were conceived, I wanted you. Before you were born, I loved you. Before you've been here two minutes, I would die for you. Jesus said, when a woman gives birth to a baby, she has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the pain because she is too happy that a child has been born into the world. What is a mother? A mother is a person that, uh, seeing that there were only four pieces of pie for five people, promptly announces that she never did much care for pie. A mother is a woman who delivers her child through birth, birth once and by car forever after. <laughs> Mothers are tough. Bathsheba was a woman in a culture where women weren't particularly respected. Went to King David and she said, hey, what's the deal? You promised my boy Solomon is going to be king? And now this Adonijah has declared himself king. And Solomon became king. In John, it tells the story of uh, uh, Jesus' first miracle. Two days later, there was a wedding in the town of Cana in Galilee. And Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his followers were also invited to the wedding. And when all the wine was gone, Jesus' mother came to him and said, They have no more wine. And Jesus answered, dear woman, why come to me? My, my time has not yet come. And she looks at him, and she looks at the servants and says, just do what he tells you. <laughs> and that's when Jesus started doing miracles. She was in charge. Mothers are tough. Motherhood is the one thing in all the world which comes closest to God in the areas of creation and sacrifice. The pain doesn't end in birth. Oh, yeah, I'm, there is some pain involved, or so I'm told. And told and told and told. My mother used to say, remind me of that over and over again. I was in labor with you for 72 hours. I think she was exaggerating. But the pain doesn't end in birth. Every difficulty that a child goes through for the rest of their life is felt by his or her mother. And how's this for a paradox? The mother-child relationship requires the most intense love on the mother's side. Yet this very love is designed to help the child grow away from the mother and become fully independent. So a mother is not a person to lean on, but a person to make leaning unnecessary. And moms have special eyes. We all know that. They can see through closed doors. They can see out the back of their heads. They have those eyes that can stop a kid in, in, his, just in his tracks at 20 paces just by the mom look. <laughs> just as importantly, they have those eyes that can look at a kid who goofed up and reflect, I understand you, and I love you, and I forgive you, without so much as uttering a word. Moms have ESP. They seem to know exactly what the kids are thinking, sometimes before the kids even think it. Don't even think of hitting your brother. And moms are smart. My friend Pete invited his mother over for dinner uh, when he was young. And during the meal, his mom couldn't help but notice that Pete's roommate was a very beautiful woman. And she'd been a little suspicious about this relationship between them, uh, that they were more than roommates. And, and Pete was reading her thoughts. And he said, look, Mom, I know what you're thinking, but I assure you, Jamie and I are just roommates. So about a week later, Jamie comes up to Peter and she says, you know, that uh, ever since your mother came to dinner, that, that beautiful silver gr uh, gravy ladle has been missing. You don't suppose your mom took it, do you? And he said, I don't think she would do that, but I'll, I'll check with her. And he emailed his mom and he said, dear mom, I'm, I'm not saying you did take 
the gravy ladle from our house. And I'm not saying you didn't take the gravy ladle from our house, but the fact remains that ever since you came to visit us for dinner, the gravy ladle has been missing. And his mom wrote back and said, Pete, <clears throat> I'm not saying you do sleep with Jamie, and I'm not saying you don't sleep with Jamie, but the fact remains that if she'd been sleeping in her own bed, she would have found the gravy ladle by now. <laughs> Moms are smart. <laughs> you don't mess with your mom. <laughs> David O. McKay said, the noblest calling in the world is that of a mother. True motherhood is the most beautiful of all arts, the greatest of all professions. She who can paint a masterpiece, who can write a book that will influence millions, deserves the plaudits and admiration of mankind, but she who rears successfully a family of healthy, beautiful sons and daughters, whose immortal souls will be exerting an influence throughout the ages, long after paintings have faded and books and statues have been destroyed, she deserves the highest honor that man can give. Let's see what people have said about mothers. The Bible describes a good wife and a mother like this. She speaks wise words and teaches others to be kind. She watches over her family and never wastes her time. Her children speak well of her. Her husband also praises her, saying, There are many fine women, but you are better than all of them. That's Proverbs 31. Some other Proverbs from around the world, some other wise sayings. Uh, a Danish proverb goes like this. A rich child often sits on a poor mother's lap. Chinese proverb, to understand your parents' love, you must raise children yourself. My mom had a version of that. Her version was, I hope when you have kids, they're just like you. <laughs> Jewish proverb goes like this, God could not be everywhere, and therefore he made mothers. The great athlete, Wilma Randolph, who was crippled with polio from the time she was a child, she, uh, she went on to win three gold medals in the 1960 Olympics. And she said this, the doctors told me that I would never walk, but my mother told me I would, so I believed in my mother. Motherhood is the greatest potential influence in human society. Our sense of security is born from a mother's hug. Our sense of affection comes from her kisses. Her sympathy and tenderness, tenderness are the first assurance that there is true love in the world. There is no influence on this earth so powerful as that as a mother. She gives her children two bequests that will last a lifetime. One is roots, the other is wings. Mothers, your job is to take care of the possible and trust God with the impossible. And for the dads, I have some advice out there. Dads, be good to your wives today. Tell her, hey, honey, don't bother with the dishes. Tonight it's Mother's Day. Just relax. You can do them in the morning. <laughs> now remember this, fathers. The most important thing you can do for your children is to love their mother. Now, I'm going to take a moment here just to, uh, to let you know that I do understand that this day is difficult for some. There are mothers that have lost their children. There are children that have lost their mothers. There are the people that have had mothers that weren't the greatest mothers in the world, and I understand all of that. And I, and I hope that this Mother's Day isn't too hard for you. But remember this. You do have one amazing parent, and that is your father in heaven. Yeah. Or... So people think father, mother in heaven. It's, uh, we don't know, it's, you know, it's, we, we call him our father, but he's sort of a father-mother mixture. He's both. So lean on, lean on God. And for those of you that do still have your mother, here's some advice for the Bible. Honor your father and mother. And from Proverbs, do not forget your mother when she is old. You know, like 40. <laughs> Make your mother and father happy. Give your mother a reason to be glad. And for those of you that have lost your mothers, let me say this to you. Your mother will always be with you. She's the soft breeze and the whisper of the leaves as you walk down the street. She's the smell of bleach in your warm, fresh laundry. She's the cool hand on your brow when you're not well. Your mother dances and dances in your laughter and she's reflected in your teardrops. She is the place you came from and the clue to where you may be headed, the map you follow 
every step that you take. She's your first love, she's your first heartbreak, and nothing on earth can separate you. Not time, not space, not even death. You carry her inside you every day, every moment. Mothers, uh, bless you. And I want you to remember this. To the world, you might be just one person, but to one person, you might just be the world. And this little Mother's Day message has been dedicated to the best mother who ever lived, the mother of your heart. So we're in a series called When Life Gives You Lemons. Best man at my wedding, Brett, uh, killed himself. He put a rope around his neck and stepped off a chair. Uh, he was an alcoholic, couldn't seem to shake it. Brett did not have God. Came home w one day to my house, and I noticed uh, my next-door neighbor was out there uh, leaning into a car window talking to a woman in the car, and, and you could, uh, just from the distance, I could feel the tension. And the car drove away, and she came over, and turns out the lady she'd been talking to was her husband's lover. And, of course, she spent the next uh, few hours in our house talking to my wife and I, and pictures arrived that were texted over that confirmed the awful truth. Now, this is a guy that was a leader at our church, not this church, but the church that we used to go to, and, and, and he, he'd gone to Promise Keepers, and I'd seen him there on bended knees praying, and he led a Bible study every week, and he knew what to say, man. He knew exactly what to say to give the impression that he was a godly man, a devout Christian, but he was not living it. Neither of these men had God. Brad, at least, was honest about it, he was an atheist, but the other guy, not so much, claimed to walk the walk while he was dancing with the devil. This is no better than proclaiming there is no God. Maybe it's worse. So faithfulness. Now, when we hear the term faithfulness, we automatically think of faithfulness in marriage and loyalty you know, to a spouse and everything. And this is very, very important. Of course, make no mistake about that. The lack of exclusivity in your relationship represents a lack of depth, a lack of intimacy. And I could easily talk about that for 30 minutes, but I'm not going to because today I'm going to talk about faithfulness. But when I say this, what I'm talking about is faithfulness, being full of faith. Romans 1.17 says, the good news shows how God makes people right with himself, and that begins and ends with faith. As the scripture says, those who are right with God will live by faith. Did you catch that? Live by faith. Not we'll have faith. We'll live by faith. You have to act on what you believe. So folks, I'm not here just to dispense information. You know, the reason I teach you people is for life change. In the Bible, you rarely see Jesus chastising people for lack of knowledge. What he chastises them is for lack of faith, as proven by lack of application. One day in a terrible storm on the water, and the, he and his disciples are on a boat, and they're scared to death that they're all going to die. And Jesus says to them, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? In other words, you know, like, I'm right here. You have little faith. Why are you so afraid? That, that's one sentence he asked the question, and he answered it. Jesus wasn't after his disciples being scriptural scholars or qu quoting the Torah. He was trying to get people to live with faith, active every day, doing the right thing, faith, to understand what it is, that, how God is pleased, and to live by that. And when I teach, I teach with that in mind. I want to give you practical, biblical ways to change your life. That's also why I don't really care if you can't tell me uh, what does John 15, 17 mean? I just want you to live it. John 15, 17, by the way, is love each other. So why am I talking about this in a series called Why Life Gives You Lemons? Well, because the best way that I know to deal with life's everyday challenges, the ups and the downs, especially the downs, is to have faith in God. Faith that he has a plan for you, that he's got your back, that he's real and he loves you and he understands what you're going through. And if you lean on him, he will see you through. I don't, honestly don't know how people get through the stuff that life throws at us without it. Hallelujah. Without that comfort, without that support. You know, back there was a time, a lot of you know this, that I grew up in, and I was an atheist for much of my life. And, and, I, and I used to say to people, well, God is just a crutch for the weak. 
And as I got to know God, I realized, yeah, <laughs> God is a crutch for the weak and thank Him that He's there for us when we're broken. That's a good thing. Now, over the past few weeks, we've talked about how when life gives you lemons, you can do a number of things. You can squeeze them and splash the juice in somebody's eyes. You can chuck a lemon at them. Or as the popular saying goes, when you, life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. lemonade. Or lemon cream pie, or lemon bars, or lemon donuts, or little lemon cakes. And in order to make lemonade, you know, you can't just take lemon. You can't just... Okay, I probably should have thought that out. <laughs> you can't just do lemons. Now, I happen to like them, but you got to add water as well. And sugar. Pure, clear water and lots and lots of pure white sugar. <laughs> lots. I think most of you know that Jesus and Jesus' teachings uh, have both been referred to in Scripture as living water. And the sweetness, the sweetness, by the way, is, is the way you relate to others, being sweet. You know, being sweet means being kind and caring and gentle and understanding and peaceful and sympathetic, nice. Loving. So dilute your sourness with living water and love. And the result is fantastic. Remember last week, Brian talked about the, the good shepherd and watching over the sheep going through the valley uh, and the shadow of uh, the valley of death and, and that they knew they were surrounded by wolves and stuff. And, uh, but the shepherd had his crook and his rod and his staff, and he could take care of them. And, and I was thinking as he said that, you know what? There's a big flock of sheep. I want to be the sheep that's next to the shepherd. Because <laughs> if there's wolves around and he's got a, a staff and a rod, I, want to be him. I don't want to be on the outsides of the flock way over there. Closer to the shepherd, safer you are. So today I'm going to talk to you about four ways, four tangible things that you can do to be closer to your shepherd, to grow in your faith, to be faithful. And the first is learn to pray. Learn to pray. Now, I know people say, I don't know how to pray. As if praying is some sort of a mystical incantation of some sort. It's not that complicated. Praying is just talking to God. It's... It's easy. Just be real, be relaxed, be relevant. Talk to Him. You don't need these. You don't need thous. You don't need to be on your knees. You don't need to be in a prayer closet. You don't need to burn incense. You don't need to be eloquent. You just need to talk to God. You don't even need to talk to God. You can think to God if you want. He can read your thoughts. Prayer is between you and God. Nobody else has to see or listen in. There's nobody else to impress. You're just talking to God. In fact, Jesus said, don't try and impress people. He said, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to stand in the synagogues and on the street corners and pray so people will see them. And I tell you the truth, they already have their full reward. When you pray, you should go into your room and close the door and pray to your Father who cannot be seen. Your Father can see what is done in secret, and He will reward you. You can pray in your bed when you're going to sleep, before you drift off. You can pray in your bed when you wake up, before you get up. You could pray in your car while you're driving. If you do that, don't shut your eyes when you pray. <laughs> <laughs> and don't you hate it when people call you on the phone and they don't identify themselves? You know, they just start talking to you and you have no idea who they are. I, I, and it didn't come up on your phone because, you know, they, they're not somebody that's, that's in your program. And you're like, who, who is this person? You don't know if it's the Pope or if it's the pizza guy. And that makes a difference on how you speak to them. It affects your conversation a lot. You don't know what tone to use. You're a little more guarded when you don't know who's on the other side of the line, who that is. And even when you're talking with somebody in person, if you don't know much about that person, it obviously makes you a little bit more formal with them. My wife and I, we used to use our cruise, cruise uh, ships a lot. And, and one day we were picking up a ship and we flew into Costa Rica, uh, San Jose, and then we took the two-hour winding drive down this little mountain pass to the ship, and we got on the ship in the middle of nowhere, and we walk down, down the hallway, and I hear, Hi, Rory! And immediately I know that's somebody from church. 
Now, at the time, we were a very, very large church, uh, 1,600 people, uh, 6,500 people, 6,500 people. We, we didn't know everybody in the church. And these people were like, hey, but they knew us. It made the conversation a lot easier because they knew us, we knew them, we had something in common. It became more friendlier, more comfortable conversations because relationship depends, uh, it determines on how you talk to somebody. Duh, Rory, thank you for stating the obvious today. <laughs> but the same thing is with, with God. You got to know God. Get to know Him. Your understanding of God, your relationship is really what shapes everything else in your life. A lot of people have misconceptions about God. Oh, man, some people think He's a grumpy God, he's cranky and upset all the time, and they could never please Him. Some people picture the crouching tiger God ready to pounce on them at any moment, you know, smite them. Smite, what a great word. You don't get that word these days. I'll smite you. You should use that more often. I'll bring back smite. Some people believe in the flaky Father God who's moody and continually changes his mind. Some people think of God as a cosmic cop whose entire goal is to make sure that you don't break the rules and punish you if you did. Some people think it's a dictator God who's never satisfied, always demanding more and more. And some people have this Plato God who they can form into any shape they want to. Just the other day, last week, I was talking to a guy, and we were talking about God, and he, and he said, you know, God is what you want him to be. And he's constantly changing depending on where you're at. And he got this idea because he came to God through AA, which, you know, tells people they need to find a higher power of some sort of power that they can relate to. And so he, he created in his mind this higher, higher power that's completely flexible and could be changed depending on where he was and his growth. And I've also heard people say, well, I like to think of God as whatever they say. It doesn't matter. You know what? It doesn't matter what you think of God as. <laughs> what matters is what the Bible says who God is. And he isn't malleable into what you want him to be. So it's important to get to know the real God. And if you have misconceptions about him, then prayer is going to be weird and uncomfortable and, 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 and maybe even a drudgery or a, or a duty. And God doesn't want you to pray to him just because you feel obligated to do so. He wants you to talk to him because you love him. And you'll love him more the more you get to know him. By sharing your life with him in prayer and by reading the Bible, which is step number two in this faith building steps is read the Bible. If you met somebody that you were like really attracted to, like you meet a new girl or a guy, you know, and you're really attracted to them and you really, you know, you want to get to know them and you're hanging out with them a bunch and then, and, 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 and they come to you and they say, you want to read my diary? So not only is my diary, it's, every, it's all my inner thoughts here. It's also a combination, it's, an, I, I, it's also part biography. It's everything that I did in my life. And, and also, this is it's what other people think of me. You want to read that? You bad! You know, snatch that out of that person's hand, run home, shut the door, and start reading. Because, because you love this person, and you want to be with them. You want to know everything there is about them. That's how you should feel about the Bible. It's all that. You know, you get to know God. And if you never read the Bible, don't let the idea scare you. Look, it's really not like a novel, you know, where you have to open it and just read from the beginning and read through the whole thing, because the idea of that is very daunting. It's that thick, and the type is this big. <laughs> but try it this way. Just open the book. Maybe start in, start in, in the New Testament. And, and maybe start at one of the God, uh, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Start at one of those and, and just read maybe three chapters of one of them. And then stop and think about the three chapters. What did you read? How does that relate to me? That was, you know, thousands of years ago. How does that relate to my life? What are they trying to teach me? What am I trying to learn here? And think about that. And that's, that's how you read the Bible. And if you don't have a Bible... Right over there on that table, there's a whole stack of Bibles, different kinds. We've got them in English, we have them in, in Spanish. We, so, and they're, they're free, just help yourself. Go and grab a Bible. Faith building step number three, giving an offering or tithing. Tithing, by the way, is 10% of your income, and uh, an offering is something above and beyond that. 
Why do we do this? Because God told us to. Now, I could leave it at that, but that answer isn't very satisfying for people. You know, remember when you were a kid and you said, why? And your parents said, because I said so? Not very satisfying. So that's why I talk about this all the time. Almost every week I talk about this, the different things I've, uh, you know, the generosity leads to generosity, sharing leads to sharing, caring for others and, and supporting those in need lead to other people caring for you and supporting you when you're in need. Because if you truly believe in a cause, then you should support it because it's a tangible, sacrificial way to show your love to God and His church, because it helps you mature, helps you be a better person, because it impresses others, inspires others. I could go on and on and on and often do. <laughs> they say, you want to know what a person cares about? Look at his checkbook. You've heard that saying? Oh, they don't say that today. Nobody uses the checkbook anymore. Look at his credit card statement or look at his PayPal account. But the point is that people pay for what they care about. If you're important to you, you'll pay for it. Jesus said your heart will be where your treasure is. Is changing people's lives by introducing them to God important to you? So you support your church. And as the Bible says, it says, in your giving through us will cause many to give thanks to God. This service you do not uh, this service you do not only helps the needs of God's people, it also brings many more thanks to God. It is proof of your faith. Many people will praise God because you obey the good news of Christ, the gospel you say you believe, and because you freely share with them and with all others. Generosity generates generosity. Another good t-shirt, along with last week's one. What was that one? There's nothing to fear when God is near. And our final faith builder for today is sharing your faith. So you have praying, Bible, giving, and sharing. Sharing your faith. You know, we talked about testimonies some weeks ago. And uh, remember how I explained it's not that hard to do a testimony. You simply tell somebody where your life was before, what made you change your life, how did you find God, and how has your life changed since you've been involved with God. That's it. Since you've had a relationship with God, before you had a relationship with God. It's not that hard. And people say, oh, I'm afraid, I'm unprepared, you know, and I feel inadequate. You know what? The Bible's full of people that are afraid, unprepared, and felt inadequate. Joshua, Saul, the king of Israel, Solomon, Jeremiah, they all felt unqualified. Remember Moses? When God came, uh, uh, came to Moses in the shape of a burning book, Moses was like 80 years old. And he felt very unqualified and inadequate. And he offered up, like, excuse after excuse. He goes, like, who am I? Should I, I should go. <laughs> and God said, I'll be there with you. And Moses said, yeah, but they're, they're not going to listen to me. They're not going to believe me. And so God gave him all these miracles that he could do to, to persuade them. And Moses said, Lord, I've never been a very skilled speaker. Even now, talking to you, I, 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 can't, I can't speak well. I speak slowly, and I, I can't find the best words. And the Lord said to him, who made a person's mouth? And who, gives, who makes somebody deaf or not able to speak? And who gives a person sight or blindness? It is I, the Lord. So go. I'll help you speak, and I'll teach you what to say. And that's what God says to us. He says, go. I'll help you speak. I'll teach you what to say. I'll put the words in your mouth. When you talk to people in a positive way about God, God will be with you. So don't worry about feeling inadequate. Even Jesus' disciples felt inadequate. You know, they, they said to him, we need to send the crowd away so we can get something to eat in the village. And Jesus says, they don't need to go away. You, you give them something to eat. So what does Jesus do? In this case, when he, he tells them to do something. When he tells them to do something... What do the disciples do? They make an excuse. Well, we only have like five loaves of bread and two fish. Some things never change. I don't have enough. You know, I'm not smart enough. I'm not educated enough. I'm not, I don't have enough resources. I don't have enough nerve. You know what else? Never changes. Jesus' response, it never changes. He, he, when they say, oh, we don't have a little bread and a, and a little fish, he says, bring them to me. Bring them to me. In other words, just bring me what you have. I'll work with that. 
Bring me your limited information, your lack of experience, your stuttering, your fear, your insecurity, whatever. Watch what I can do with it. And he can do things with it. One person I know was very, very nervous about telling their story, sharing their testimony. And afterwards, they said to me, oh, man, I was never so dependent on God. And I said, hallelujah. That's a good thing. So don't be afraid. Telling your story is, is the next step in growth and positive change. Just like going to an AA meeting, an NA meeting, an overeaters meeting, whatever. You share your experience with other people. And it might be inspiring to them. You know what inspiring means? It means stirring. It might be rousing, awakening, stimulating, rallying, moving, encouraging, motivating, invigorating, reviving, thrilling, instigating, igniting. Yes, I own a thesaurus. <laughs> Inspire people. Share your story. Second Corinthians says it is written in the scriptures. I believed, so I spoke. Our faith is like this too. We believe, so we speak. 2 Corinthians 9.13 says, it is, it is a proof of your faith. Many people will praise God because they obey the good news of Christ, the gospel you say you believe, and because you freely share with them and with all others. Because you share with them, yes. Freely share with them, he says, and all with all others. Freely share with them. Let's go back a few words. To take that to the next level, it is proof of your faith. Many people will praise God because you obey the good news of Christ. The gospel you say you believe in. Did you catch that word? Obey. Obey the good news of Christ. Which brings us to the final, fourth and final faith-building step for today. The part that will help your faith grow more than any other, and that is live it. Act on it. Jesus says, everyone who hears my words and obeys them is like a wise man who built his house on rock. It rained hard, the floods came, and the winds blew and hit that house, but it did not fall because it was built on rock. Everyone who hears my words and does not obey them is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. There's a wonderful little movie on Netflix right now called The Interview with God. And if you've got Netflix, check it out. And at one point he says... Uh, can an atheist, they get interviewer says, can an atheist be a good person? And God says, sure, an atheist can be a good person. He could also build a house on sand, but he better hope that there's no bad weather coming up. It's a good movie. Check it out. It does no good to hear the word, memorize the Bible, quote scripture, come to charge, and then not live it like my next door neighbor. You can't act one way in here and then a completely different way out there. Otherwise, looks what it says in James uh, 2, 20 through 24. It says, you foolish person, must you be shown that faith that does nothing is worth nothing? Abraham, our ancestor, was made right with God by what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. So you see that Abraham's faith and the things he did worked together. His faith was made perfect by what he did. This shows the full meaning of the scripture that says Abraham believed God and God accepted Abraham's faith and that faith made him right with God. And Abraham was called God's friend. So you see that people are made right with God by what they do, not by faith only. Did you hear that? You got to act at claiming to be a Christian and, and not walking the walk is worse than saying nothing. Because it can actually turn people against God. It's dangerous. It's deadly. Deadly? Yeah, it's deadly. It's deadly to relationships. It's deadly to other people's faith. Because when we say that we are Christ followers and we do not act like it, then we send a message out to the world. That message is all this God talk is just that. It's just God talk. It's just an excuse to judge others and feel superior. And that hypocrisy, that saying one thing and acting in another is deadly to belief. Held me back from being a Christian for a long time. And when I finally did decide to follow Christ, I didn't want to call myself a Christian. I, I wanted to totally walk and follow all the rules that Jesus put out, but 
I called myself a Christ follower. You know why? Because the word Christian has such bad connotations to it. I don't want to be put into that category. And then I realized I was doing Christianity a disservice by that because <laughs> somebody had to call themselves a Christian and actually act like a Christian so people could see what a Christian was supposed to be. So I took that little challenge on. That's what I want you guys to do. I want you to show people what it really is like to be a Christian. Let's live our faith. Let's show the world. And when you do that, it helps the next person do that. If you can do it, I can do it. Paul said, I mean that I want us to help each other with the faith we have. Your faith will help me. My faith will help you. Faith helps. So that's why I think that the best way to, to take lemons and make them into lemonade is to have faith to trust in God, get, him, get to know Him better so you can do that, so you can trust in Him. He's got your back. He's there for you. He'll get you through it. You have to be full of faith, faithful. So when life is handing you lemons, you can turn to Him. And you may end up with these lovely little lemon cakes. Let's take a moment and pray. Father God, thank you for being the God you are and help us get to know you more. Help us in our relationship with you. Help us learn to pray. Help us read the Bible. Help us tithe. Help us walk the walk. Remind us over and over again to love each other and to show the world what being a true Christian really means. And we'll need your help with that, but we know you got us. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.